The clear, swift streams of the Ozark Highlands of southern Missouri and northern Arkansas are a priceless national resource. Most are under attack from proposals to dam their waters forever or from the simple pressure of progress. This film shows what we all might lose if these streams are destroyed. This journal of mine is a sort of continuing love letter to a river, a testimonial to half a lifetime of devotion. The dents on this canoe are records too, each one telling of swift currents and hidden hazards. We've seen a lot of water together and taken more than a few bumps. The rivers flow downstream together in my mind as the scratches and nicks blend on the aluminum hull of my canoe until there is only one river that is a medley of a score of clear, swift streams, each one a jewel in the crown of the Ozark Highlands. The river is water, of course, but also a great deal more. It is color and sound and movement. It is light and shadow, and fog-shrouded mornings. It is the narrow world of the gasoline lantern and the campfire, with only the night sounds testifying that there's a larger world beyond the campfire's glow. The river is essentially movement, with a new wonder around every bend. It is the pleasant pause at noon, with rushing water urging you on, even as you pause. It is seeking the unseen from beneath the river's glassy face. It is the denizens that call the river home. These are the things that make a river to me and the reason why I return time after time in all seasons. I have no quarrel with those who like impounded water, but the moving, changing scene is more precious than diamonds to some of us. Each river has its characteristics, like the granite gorges of the St. Francis, one of the brawling streams of the Ozark Highlands. They have history too, as the big Piney River hosted log rafters. Some have a wide fame, like the current river, now preserved in Ozark National Scenic Riverways. And the Moody 11 Point has been designated a component in the National Scenic River system. There are others, no less wild and lovely, like the Buffalo River of Arkansas with towering cliffs. Whatever their name or mood or character, they merge into one free-flowing stream when viewed back down the years of recollection. The essential thing is motion, the flow of the river. Some rivers drop as much as 20 feet to the mile, though the average is more like 10 feet to the mile. The upper reaches are often swift and choppy with a roller coaster ride down the chutes. There isn't a lot of time to take in the scenery when the action is fast. The banks become a sort of blur and all your attention is riveted on the swirling water. There's a bend ahead and rapids that call for some quick decisions if you don't want to get dunked. 
Swift reaches alternate with eddies and quiet pools, where the floater can relax and enjoy the scenery and take stock. Life along the stream changes from headwaters to lowland, with different plants and animals to be seen and enjoyed as you progress downstream. Then the next rough water is ahead, and you've got to plan your route. Mistakes can be unpleasant, but they're seldom serious in most Ozark streams. Once you've chosen your way through, it depends on skillful handling of the canoe and having enough speed to be moving faster than the water. Aluminum canoes are very forgiving, being able to absorb a lot of punishment, but the best of them needs bailing occasionally. And teamwork is appreciated when you run into trouble in fast water. The face of a river is portrayed on a topographic map. All our Ozark rivers have their origin in stony hills, but a few have their immediate source in springs. This wild spring has been protected by private considerate hands and has thus escaped the fate of many springs that become trampled or despoiled by visitors. All streams are products of runoff from rain and snow but some water passes through the soil and rock mantle and emerges as springs. The Ozarks are noted for many springs, often with a large volume of flow. They are valuable natural sources and well worth preserving. They gush up from gravel and issue from the rocky face of bluffs. Some emerge under considerable pressure. Some springs come from the mouths of caves large enough to attract the canoeist. All are clear and cold, often with their own unique plant and animal life, finding niches because of the special climate created by the spring. Some spring branches carry enough water to be streams in their own right. Their water hurrying to join the flood from above, cooling the water of the river and affecting its life forms. A river is also the trees and other plants that are part of its watershed. They help regulate the flow of the river but equally important to the floater of rivers, the foliage backdrop lends an aesthetic dimension. Our river hills are some of the continent's oldest land above water. Yet the streams are relatively young because they continue to cut their way through the mantle of rock today. The St. Francis courses through rocks dating back perhaps some 550 million years. And the granite cliffs of the St. Francis display the beginnings of life in their lichen-coated rocks, which promise one day to become soil. Overlying the granites on other rivers are sandstones and various limestones and dolomites, 
usually with fossil evidence that ancient seas once covered this place where we placidly paddle. Much closer to our own time, red men lived along these shores, sometimes dwelling in the many cave entrances and bluff overhangs, paddling these streams and leaving evidence of their passing that we may occasionally chance upon. All of these things are a priceless part of my river. So too are the life forms beneath the running water, often only guessed at. It's pleasant to peer down the tangled roots of a bank-hugging sycamore to see creatures like the smallmouth bass that find their homes in gravel-bottomed streams. Minnows feed on algae covering the gravel. Most people pass unaware over fish so colorful as to rival tropical fish, each playing an important role in the total story of the stream. The surface barrenness is deceptive because beneath it, life goes its busy way. I'm always glad to see the hog sucker vacuuming the stream bottom because its presence tells me the stream is yet unpolluted. In shallower parts, I sometimes watch the horny head chub carrying rocks to build its nest. Few fish are as busy unless it be the long-eared sunfish on its communal spawning grounds. Seeing the sights of the river is important, but sharing them is even more so. Someone once wrote about the blessedness of shared solitude, and on the river, I heartily agree. You don't have to say anything, a nod or a smile, and the thing is shared, the mood unbroken. It calls for a receptive state of mind, because a river's tiny vignettes are fleeting as dragonflies. You take them as they come. But you don't see everything. Wild eyes watch you. Perhaps you heard the wild turkey's gobbles ringing on the ridge above camp this morning. But unless you seek him out, you may miss sighting him. Occasionally, we leave the frail skin of our canoe and hike the banks, where even more sights and sounds are to be found. It's a different point of view like getting a squirrel's eye view of flocks or mayapple. Or chancing on a woodcock's nest. The odd timber doodle lives along ridges and in moist bottoms, but finding one of its nests is rare enough to be a red letter day in our lives. Many river creatures are rarely seen. The beaver, a nocturnal animal, is seldom glimpsed in daylight. But this giant rodent is nevertheless a valuable asset to the life of the river. Beaver sign, however, is obvious to the discerning eye. Beaver peel sticks can be spotted by the regularity of the tooth marks. Look at that beaver cutting over there. Always interesting are the boles of trees that beavers have gnawed. The girth of a tree doesn't daunt a beaver's ambitions in the least. We like to share the background sounds of the river, too, the subtle melodies of cricket frogs and tree frogs, until they are shattered by the raucous cry of the pileated woodpecker. This largest of our woodpeckers is on the increase. Snags like these serve as woodpecker nurseries. <laughs> the pale water willow flowers are often overlooked by canoeists, but not by pipe vine butterflies. <laughs> 
other visitors to the river's edge catch our attention. Br'er Woodchuck looks us over, decides we're no threat. The prothonotary warbler is a flash of gold amid the green of summer. In any narrow channel, behind any screen, a new meeting may be waiting to be consummated, this time with a great blue heron. He feeds on minnows, and perhaps today we'll see him catch one. Heron, minnow, blossoming lizard tail, they're all fragments of the river picture. An equally important ingredient to a man like me is the comradeship of the river. The pleasant hardships of a river camp knit a family together as few things can. We all enjoy the chilly mornings with their promise of what the day will bring. The domestic chores of camp are expressions of our shared love for the wild. No net ever caught fish as lovely as morning dew. And no invitation to the day was ever as welcome. And no water is ever as cold as that filling our shoes for the first time in the morning. The shared sights and sounds strengthen our friendships with one another and with the river. The things we learn about during a day afloat are deeper savored for having been chanced upon rather than designed. We bring willing hearts and an awareness to see and hear, which is a pitifully small contribution compared to what we take away. We seek ever to know the river more intimately. As the day warms up, a closer communion with the river seems appropriate. Land is your land, this land is I always treasure memories of roll your own music and hearty lunches. Young folks add something to the river. Our group has always believed a wild river should be free. And that means free of trash and litter, too. Take nothing but pictures and leave nothing but tracks makes a good slogan to observe when intruding on a river. Young people enjoy the challenges and soon develop necessary skills the water demands. Unlike western rivers, our streams are seldom really dangerous, but they do require some dexterity unless one wants a spill. People of all ages can enjoy an Ozark stream with less hazard than they meet any day on a crowded city street. We've been afloat in my family since the youngsters were mere infants. And the adventures we've shared have made self-reliant young adults of the children and knit our family closer than anything else we've ever done. Of course there are obstacles and we wouldn't have it any other way. They are part of the surprises and uncertainties and what helps keep the illusion of wildness in our rivers. They also teach us humility. They teach us teamwork and remind us that a river is a living thing with sometimes awesome power that can pile up giant trees like these in flood time. The popularity of our streams in recent years means that fishing pressure has increased tremendously. Where one person might have cast a lure at a root wad in former years, 10 or 100 lures might be seeking fish today. Because of this, our gang fishes mostly for fun. Travel bars are the traveler's rest along the river. I think our gang is happiest when loafing around camp on a summer's evening. This land is 
and nothing beats stew from an open campfire unless it's going to sleep to the calls of the river's night shift barred owls and whippoorwills outdoors as we do, we make adjustments to the weather. Rain never hinders our enjoyment of the river because good rain gear keeps us relatively dry and we sleep dry and warm. I can take anything as long as I get a good night's sleep and I'm well fed. Rain is just a different aspect of our river trips and folks who stay home in wet spring weather miss out on a lot. It seems to me the river puts on a whole new face in rainy weather. is only a minor discomfort as long as you have a campfire and good companionship. Then all you have to do is relax. The weather's going to change, but even if it doesn't, we're ready for what comes. Almost before you know it, summer is gone. Autumn leaves begin drifting on the currents, and the river puts on yet another face. The weather is usually mild, chilly at night, but pleasant during the day. And I get to debating with myself which season I like best, with fall perhaps my favorite. Autumn foliage is at its colorful best in October, when many folks have left the river. The brilliant colored hills form a pleasant backdrop as I reflect on the many values the river has for me. How could you put a price tag on a glorious day like this? This sparkling stream has flowed through these hills for so long that I wonder how a puny man can seriously think of despoiling all this. What was that sound? Probably a squirrel. And yet, there are those who would dam up or otherwise alter or abuse this river and its watershed. I wonder if they've ever drifted through an autumn day on such a stream. There's that squirrel again. They tell me that even the giant sycamores along my river are doomed. Uses for their wood means they'll never again grow to the size they once did. I wonder sometimes exactly what progress means and if we can really afford its costs. But a day like this can shake off even the gloomiest thoughts. There's always too much to see and too much to do. There's a little less inclination to get one's feet wet this time of year, so summer paddling skills take on added importance. Running the river is exhilarating any time, but on crisp fall days, it is especially so. Who'd trade an armchair for a canoe on a day like this? What painting could rival colors like these? But for all of autumn's breathtaking hues, there is still more to a free-flowing river. Not even winter can keep me away. The bright winter days following a fresh snow have a special beauty of their own. The winter landscape is stark and uncluttered, and the special features can be savored without competition. 
Some summer creatures are still with us, but others have left or new ones moved in. Purple finches from the north add a dash of color. The titmouse is much in evidence. Winter may call for some different canoeing techniques. You'd probably wade this spot in summer, but in winter, a spruce pole tipped with a metal spike helps in navigating the swifter places. Anyway, it keeps your feet dry, which is especially appreciated. You can be pretty much alone on the river now, which makes it possible to see and enjoy sights and sounds that you might otherwise miss. We even take winter camping trips. Proper clothing and good camp gear makes an otherwise rigorous time enjoyable. All it takes is a little courage and a lot of common sense about preparations. A big part of that preparation is planning for plenty of hot, nourishing food. Much of the river's edge is hidden by vegetation in other seasons, but in winter, a whole new world unfolds. Some things remain unchanged, like the rush of a swift chute and the tingling warmth of exertion. But in the quieter moments, the little winter scenes reveal themselves. Melting snow, and little ground seeps and freezing temperatures convert a limestone cliff into a stunning tapestry of ice. Thus the rivers continue to flow, as they have for thousands of years, and we yield to their call for our little space of time. It's all there in my notebook, the sights, the sounds, the smells, one man's impressions that call up the rivers in my mind's eye when I'm away from their flow in my workaday world. They are too few, these free-flowing streams of the Ozarks, too many have been dammed, or parts of them changed forever from what they once were. Some are on the drawing board now for flood control or power projects. Others are feeling the pressure of increasing population. Pollution from many sources has not yet seriously marred most of them, but the cloud hangs on the horizon. How can an increasing population use these rivers and yet save them? I don't know all the answers. I only know this. Both my youngsters and myself and others, I'm sure, have learned a great deal from nature's store along these rivers. We're grateful for that. And in our gratitude, we can only pledge that we will work so that others may enjoy the things we have known. Somehow, we must find a way to ensure that the rivers will continue to flow clean and free for all our tomorrows.